What's the word, y'all? Today, I'm giving my Eastern Conference playoff predictions, or at least for the first round. And this is the first year where I honestly do believe that I had to really take some time to think about who I was picking. Historically, Eastern Conference is like, who's the higher seed? That's the one I'm going with. I think out of the four first round matchups, three of them, you could have a genuine argument for either of the two teams. And that's great because that's always been the case out West. Out East, it was pretty, pretty generic. And today's not the case. Honestly, I don't care if it's the Bulls. I don't care if it's the Miami Heat. I'm picking the Boston Celtics to win that series in five. I'm, I'm going to give the opposing team one game because the Celtics sometimes do do the thing where they play down in a competition. But whoever it is, I'm giving the Celtics in five. I was thinking about before I started recording this video, if we can bind the Chicago Bulls and, and the Miami Heat currently, so no Terry Rozier, uh, no Jimmy Butler, whatever, whatever. If we can bind the Bulls and the Miami Heat, is that enough to even beat the Boston Celtics? Let alone one of the two teams, but if we can bind them, is that enough? You can argue that maybe not. So Celtics, that's the that's the first prediction. Celtics over whoever in five. This two seven matchup is so interesting, man. Um, shout out to Tom Thibodeau and the the New York Knicks last day of the NBA season. They had an opportunity to avoid this. They could have avoided the Miami Heat. They could have avoided the Philadelphia 76 in the play-in. And they decided they wanted to win a, a basketball game, right? It was them versus the Bulls. They had already known every other every other game had wrapped up. If they lost this game, they could have been the three seed, which puts them against the Pacers which is probably a better matchup for them versus going against the 76ers, right? And the 76ers, of course, when Tyrese Max and Joel Abita are playing at 31-7. and 31-7 and seven this season. They could have avoided that. But Tom Thibodeau is like, I don't care. I want to win basketball games. Whoever our opponent is, I feel comfortable with us. I feel comfortable with my coaching ability to beat them. And I like that. I hate when teams try to mess with the basketball gods like the Cavaliers did, and we're going to talk about them. I hate when they mess with the basketball gods and try to lose on purpose for a favorable matchup. The Knicks didn't do that. I guess we'll see. Maybe it would have made sense for them to do it because the 76ers is not a great matchup for them. A lot of times I go into a playoff series, and not, not all the times, I would probably say 75% of the time, I would say, who has the best player in the series? Because a lot of the time, especially early in the playoffs, that is the team I would, I'm going to rat with. And though Jalen Brunson has been phenomenal this season, you can argue that he should be on all NBA first team. He ain't Joel Embiid. But the reason, here's my prediction. The reason I'm going with the Knicks in seven is because I didn't love the way Joel Embiid moved in that playing game. And, and you're trying to tell me we got a full seven game series with Tom Thibodeau being able to scheme against Joel Embiid a little bit. Like if Joel Embiid was completely healthy, I probably would take the Philadelphia 76ers, especially considering there's no Julius Randle in this matchup. But because Joel Embiid doesn't look like 80% of himself as far as his movement goes, I'm a little bit afraid to pick them in the seven game series. Like if Joel Embiid has another not so great game, and I would argue that that one playing game versus the Miami Heat wasn't so great. The last three minutes of it was phenomenal. Shout out to JoJo. But the first, 45 minutes of it he didn't look amazing they can't really afford that they they, they can't uh, expect Nicholas Batum to drop a 20 piece when he averages two points per game on the season there's not a ton of wiggle room in a seven game series against a team like the New York Knicks who are well coached they're a grinded team and they gonna put you on your ass Jojo that's just the reality of it. Joel Embiid is not a guy that would shy away from contact. That's just who he is. He likes to get to the free throw line. He's okay with that contact. But Isaiah Hardenstein is a bruiser. Mitchell Robinson is a bruiser. Hell, Jericho Sims is, even though he probably never, not even going to see a single second in the series. They have options on options on options. And on the offensive side of the ball, the things that scares me a little bit about the Knicks is that Jalen Brunson had the highest usage rate in the second half of the season. He's been phenomenal in that. He was phenomenal last year in the playoffs with that. But it does scare me when a bulk of their offense, 90% of their offense is based on one singular player the problem is you look at the other side of the philadelphia 76ers there's not many people that you would trust to guard jalen brunson in the series now i know basketball is not mano y mano you don't expect it to be uh kyle Lowry versus jalen brunson 48 minutes they're gonna throw different schemes they're gonna they're gonna blitz they're gonna do this they're gonna do that but there's not a lot of people i trust to guard jalen brunson in this series and because of that i'm taking the new york knicks like i think the knicks and the 76 are both going to try to put the opposing star guard in as many actions as, poss as possible. As good of a fire hydrant Jalen Brunson is, and he's competitive defensively, you're going to see him get put in pick and rolls over and over again because they want him to defend. Not only because he's probably their weakest defensive option on the court, but because he's their star player. And we're trying to, if we can have Jalen Brunson use five more percent on the defensive side of the ball, that's less, that's five less percent on the offensive side. So yes, put him in every single action. The Knicks are going to do the exact same thing. Tyrese Maxey is a thinner, smaller guard. So yes, we will see Jalen Brunson get the switch to Tyrese Maxey and him try to eat. We're going to see the other way around. And I'm so very excited for it. But 
Then again, the 76ers have the best player in the series and the third best player in the series. You got two of the top three players in the series? Again, historically, I would pick that team. But today, I'm picking the New York Knicks in seven. If you like these type of videos where I'm breaking down some stuff, uh, I drop a podcast two times a week where it's just this, but it's 30 minutes to 45 minutes. It's a lot more content. Uh, so the link is in the description. Let's go to the 3-6 matchup. It is Bucks and it is Pacers. And we don't know the status of Giannis, who has his calf injury. And it, it, everybody's talked about it. The calf injury is one of those ones that it could heal fast. It could take some time. Giannis, throughout the entirety of his career, has been this fast healing guy. Remember in the in the finals where he had his, his leg bent back backwards in the series versus the Suns. And I, I remember watching it like, man, this is the end. Of, you know, they fall all the way here just for their star player to get injured. And then he dropped 50 in the closing out game. Like nothing really happened. There's a few injuries throughout his career where it looked like like, he's going to be out. And there's like, oh, no, it's Giannis. He's, he'll be back. I don't know how I feel about this one. Because uh, they're, they're, I don't know if they're trying to temper the expectation or what it may be. But I'm going to assume he's at least missing game one. And even if it is just game one, that changes the landscape of this series. The same thing I would say, well, the same thing I said about Philadelphia. If Joel Embiid was 100%, I'm taking them. But he doesn't look 100%. I feel the same thing about the Bucs. If, if, if you would told me that Giannis was playing every single game with his series and he was 100% healthy, I would take them and it would be a no-brainer. Even though they have not impressed me at all since Doc Rivers came onto the team. But because he's not there, it makes me think a lot about it about it a little bit more. Now, these two teams played each other, I think, five times this year. Four of those games went to the Indiana Pacers. But the last time they played against each other, Doc Rivers wasn't the coach. Uh, Pascal Siakam wasn't on the team. It was just, just a lot of different things. These teams are dramatically different. When they did that, when they played against each other the first time, the Indiana Pacers one of the worst defensive teams in basketball. But since the trade deadline, they have been middle of the pack, like 16th. That's a dramatic difference. The last time the Bucks played the Pacers, they were the worst transition team in basketball, or one of the bottom three transition teams in basketball. And one thing you said about Doc Rivers' little regime so far is he's got these guys getting back on defense. So these are not the same teams that we saw last time they played against each other. Not only that, our boy Tyrese Halliburton hasn't looked nearly as good as he did before the hammy injury, the freak hammy injury that held him out for a little bit of time. Here's Tyrese Halliburton's averages versus the Bucks in those five games. 27 points per game, 11 assists, six rebounds, 37% from three and 53% from the field. Again, really great numbers, but that's not the Tyrese Halliburton we've got for the last, let's say, two months or so. The good thing is the last couple games before the season ended, he had been looking at least better Still not great, though, but better. The entire philosophy of the Indiana Pacers defense under Rick Carlisle is run teams off the three-point line and trust your back end. And it's Miles Turner, who deserves to get a lot of respect because he is fearless. He will contest every single shot at the rim. Um, and they do a damn good job at that, where, like, they give up the most amount of attempts in the paint, but they're about league average in percentage. So they get you there. They let you get there, but they don't allow you to finish more likely than not. The Bucks. And their games without Giannis. And again, I'm, I'm going under the assumption that he at least missed one game in this series. The thing that scares me about that is they don't get to the rim if Giannis does not play. Nobody else does. So this defense is their whole idea is to run you off the line. And you're not known as a team that can get downhill and go to the basket. You're playing basically right into their, right into their hands. But Dane, this is a huge, huge, huge Dane series couple games now people forget it's been some time since we've seen Damian Lillard in the playoffs and I'm not gonna question him because he's one of the clutcher players I've seen in my lifetime but this is huge for him because they've been relatively decent right relatively decent without Giannis they held their own against some of the best teams in basketball I remember the one game against the Celtics um about a month or so ago where no Giannis and they made it very very competitive and that was like there may be no moral victories in basketball but that if that, that's the closest thing you could get to a moral victory right they, they've held their own and they need Dame if Giannis is missing that game one to showcase why they traded everything they did to get him. In the last eight games without Giannis, here's Dame's averages. That's pretty good, Dame. 38 and 4. You'll take that. And I'm trying to figure out what's the determinative factor for me to lean one way or another. If Giannis is only missing a singular game, I'm going to take Bucks and seven. But if Giannis misses more than one game, I'm taking the Pacers to win that series in whatever the number really is. Um, I think they have enough pieces where they have so many different people that you can kick it out to. From Neesmith to Turner to Pascal, who's a basically a 40% three-point shooter since he's been traded. Their offense is not my worries, and now their defense is caught up at least a little bit. I feel okay about that. But again, it's all really contingent on how many games Giannis misses. The last one is the Cavs versus the Orlando Magic. 
I've expressed this on the candy pod, but I'll do it again. I hated the way the Cleveland Cavaliers ended their season. And I don't even, I'm not even talking about the fact that they were sub 500 since the All-Star break. I mean, going into the last day of the season, they had an opportunity to win a game against a very bad Charlotte Hornets team. And what did J.B. Bickerstaff slash whoever's running the show over there decide to do? They decided to lose the last game on purpose for the sake of trying to get away from Philly or Miami as if the Orlando Magic are this bad basketball team or anything. They they greatly limited their ceiling, and I hate that about way, the way they ended this year. Right? Let's say you become the two seed, which would have happened if they would have closed out that game versus the Charlotte Hornets. You become the two seed, and yes, you do have to go against Joel Embiid in the Philadelphia 76ers in the first round. But you're, if you get out of that series, your matchup versus Milwaukee or the Pacers is a lot, you, your upside is a lot higher than going against the Celtics in the second round. Even if you beat the Orlando Magic, you're probably getting dogged by the Celtics. So we just okay as a front office to lose on purpose and limit our overall ceiling? That hurts my heart. Because they tried to lose this game. You know how some teams in the last day of the season, they weren't necessarily trying to lose, but like we weren't playing for anything. So we'll play our starters for three quarters and let the rest of the players. No, in this game, they ran out of lineup. Matter of fact, let me show you. Let me show you. I got all the footage. With eight minutes to go in this game, they're up by six. Look at the lineup they're running. There's Max Struess. There's Pete Nance. That's Isaiah Mobley. That, that, is, um, that is Imani Bates and Damian Jones. A wicked, wicked lineup. They're up by six with seven minutes to go. We can't afford to win this game, so let's go, let's go later. Let's go later in this game. Uh-oh, they no longer have the lead. They no longer have the lead, ladies and gentlemen. You know why? Because the point guard today is Imani Bates. That's fine. Imani played some guard in high school and stuff. We know he can handle it. Tristan Thompson, it's setting up the O. That is Tristan Thompson. That is uh, Pete Nance. Isaiah Mobley. Damian Jones is playing the corner as a spacer. They are losing on purpose. They are losing on purpose. Because they were afraid of Joel Embiid or Jimmy Butler. And the real pro... Look at this. This is nasty. That's nasty. I'm getting out of here. That's nasty work. And the problem with this, the problem with it is not that they lost, right? It's not that they're lost on purpose. It, they, they greatly limited the ceiling on their team. So yes, you go against the Orlando Magic, and hell, there's no guarantee that you're beating the Orlando Magic, and we're going to talk about that. But you go against the Orlando Magic, let's hypothetically say you beat them. You know you see in the second round? It's the it's the Boston Celtics who are the best team in basketball. If you win this game, yes, you have to go through Joel Embiid, or at that point, it was either Joel Embiid or Jimmy Butler in the Miami Heat. But if you got out of that series, your second round matchup against the Butts of the Pacers is a lot easier than going against the Boston Celtics. This screams to me, we need to win one playoff series, and we'd be happy because you're not beating the Boston Celtics. You're just not. You have a better chance of beating the Bucks or the Pacers in the second round. But you were afraid to do that. Because you were afraid to lose in the first round of Joel Embiid. No matter what happens, JB's probably getting fired. There's going to be so many rumors swirling around this team about a certain number 45 on the team. So why not just go out there and play basketball? It blew my mind. Because that's not the Cavaliers I know. That's not the Cavaliers that I've been enjoying watching for the last two years. I was just disappointed. But to this actual series... Like I said, there is no guarantee that the uh, that the Cavs are going to win this, even though they have the experience. Everybody that's going to be a part of their rotation has playoff experience. And on the other side of things, the, the Orlando Magic come in with close to zero as a team. It is dramatic. It's night and day in that aspect. I expect Jared Allen to be better in the series after the lights are too bright in New York. I expect Evan Mobley to be better in the series, who's shooting 47% from three on one and a half uh, attempts since the All-Star break. I expect all of those things. But the thing that beat their ass last year a team that's very physical in the New York Knicks and a team that crashed the glass in the New York Knicks, the Orlando Magic has all of that. Now, their upside offensively is very limited compared to what the Knicks had last year with Jalen Brunson and stuff. But still, the weak part of your team, and may maybe they bandaged that with some of the offseason signings. Maybe George and Yang helped with that tough toughness. Maybe Max Struess' shooting improves everything. It's possible. It's definitely possible. But the things that caused y'all to lose last year's series, the opposing team that you're going against provide that stuff. Ultimately, I'm still going to pick the Cavs to win this series because I think they have the higher offensive upside because Donovan Mitchell is a monster, even though he has also not looked good since coming back from the face injury and the, the shot ejection in his knee, whatever the hell it was. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Orlando Magic win this. I'm picking Cavs in seven.
It's going to be a nasty series as far as it being a 90 to 91 game or stuff like that. I'm here for that type of stuff. But overall, I think that the that the Magic are going to make it a re really, really tough. What they did at the last part of the season, which I don't know if a lot of people recognize, is that Jonathan Isaac was, was starting over Wendell Carter. That's a problem for the Cavaliers because Jonathan Isaac is the best minute per minute defender in all of basketball. And we can see him guard Donovan Mitchell. We just can't. Paolo's going to have his hand full with Evan Mobley being his primary defender. But the, the overall Orlando Magic is a very big team. The Cavs are a smaller team. Other than their two front court players being seven footers, the rest of the team is relatively small. The Orlando Magic have size all over the roster. Like they don't start a person under six foot. I'm picking Cavs in seven. I don't know. I'm, I might want to flip it because I'm just so frustrated with the Cavs. Maybe I'm just shifting it right now. Orlando Magic is seven. I guess it don't really matter because whoever it is probably losing in the second round anyway. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about the Cavs. Uh, we'll talk about the Boston Celtics beating up on the Bulls because hopefully the Bulls win tonight. Oh, yeah. All right. So that's everything. That's every single series in the Eastern Conference. Um, hey, I was three for four in the play-in. Let's see if I'm four for four here or three for four here as well. Leave a like, subscribe. All fluid conversations. The comment section completely open for your opinions. What did I hit on? What did I miss on? Only time will tell. Go out there and enjoy some basketball.